Now let's move on to electronic scanning and hybrid scanning techniques for antennas. This will be another lengthy section, about 70 view graphs, so it'll be a number of segments to this section. And, it, and I've broken it down into a whole lecture, lecture 9. And this is just to reiterate, we're looking at the antenna portion of the radar system. And I don't have to go over this again just very fast. The antenna is the means for radiating and receiving radio waves. We want to give directivity to the beam and in the direct desired direction, focus it in a de desired direction and suppress energy going to others. And we want to do that in an optimum fashion. And here we had gone over before for search and track the relative parameters that were important. And I showed you this picture before when we were going over antennas in general. And this would be a, a classic uh, mechanical scanning antenna. Or uh, this, uh, this is Trade X out at Kwajalein. This is an ASR9. But we've got these other antennas here and here and here and here. And they've got flat faces. And as I mentioned before, um, these two antennas scan mechanically an azimuth. This is the, and, and this antenna is an array of slots where the radiation is emitted out of the slots. And, and this is a frequency scanning antenna. And this antenna system, it's a whole radar, has two faces where we electronically scan each face independently with thousands by changing the phasing of thousands of elements that are transmitting in each, in each independent section. Uh, we, we control the phase so that we can point a beam very agilely and very fast in any direction we want, subject to constraint, which you're going to learn a bit about more. And here's another electronically scanned antenna. Okay, so there's, there's a lot of different ways which we can electronically scan antennas. So we're going to start first off with the basics of, of phased arrays, and then look at frequency scanning antenna te techniques and other techniques. And then we're going to look at different hybrid methods that what people use. OK, so I've started a little bit to go over this with you. We're going to look at linear and planar arrays. Then we're going to look at grading lobes, which are uh, big side lobes that pop up in places where you don't want them. And they're related to not having the optimum um, relationship. You're, you're really constrained in terms of the spacing between your elements that are going to be transmitting simultaneously and the wavelength and where you place them, how you place them, geometry in a plane or linearly. And grading lobes can appear that can suck away the energy from the main beam and give you less energy where you want it. Uh, or it might tell you the, the uh, if you had a grading load that the target could be in that direction or that direction. You certainly want that beam to be in one well-placed direction. And then we're going to talk about how we shift the phase quickly, which makes these a big difference over mechanical scanning antennas. We have all that inertia. Remember that Altair antenna was near a million pounds. You don't shift that, but with phase shifters, electronic phase shifters, I'm going to show you that are, that are made up with ferrite or diode technology. You can, you, in, in the order of, mil, of microseconds, you can shift the beam electronically. Now that's real time agility. And we're going to look at array feeds, how we feed these different phased array elements. And then we're going to look at architectures of phased array antennas.
Then we'll move on to frequency scanning of antennas. And then we'll look at hybrid methods of scanning, which will combine different elements of both the mechanical scanning and these other methods, and then go on to other topics. OK, now let's just start off back with our basics. We've got an, a single element. It's radiating. This little triangle symbolizes it. And it, it, it is radiating out that element in all directions an equal amount. It's isotopically, isotropically radiating. And there, the response, the directivity as a function of direction, is just flat. You're going to get the same directivity everywhere. If we take a very small array of three isotropically radiating sources, and we combine them, keeping the electrical length of each of them into this combiner, which just adds them up the same, well, you see we'll get a, a, a summing of the direction in the forward direction. They'll all, all add up constructively in the forward direction, and they'll destructively interfere away from that forward direction. And it's, you can see a pretty broad beam width. If we add a lot more elements to the array, we see that the beam width goes down, and you get more side lobes, little dips. But there's one other thing you can do. Remember, this is directing the energy in the broadside direction. If we introduce along these feeds from the transmitting source out to the array, I'm assuming it's, it's transmitting, where uh, you have phase, if we put phase shifters in, and we put just the right phases so that when we're looking at a direction uh, off to the side, say this was 30 degrees, and when we were looking way off over here, so that the energy that reached it from, he from here was at a peak in its sine wave. This one with a different phase shift was also at a peak. This one, so that they all were at a peak in their sinusoidal variation, not at the bottom where they destructively interfere. Then we'll get a bump over here but it will have moved in angle. So that's one of the th reasons you like to be able to have phase shifters is not only it, what you can do is you can move the beam. And now the question is how do we set up the phase shifters with what phase? So multiple antennas combined, they can enhance the radiation and shape the pattern. And the more elements you have, here we have the same number of elements. We're just moving the beam with the, with the phase shifters. But when you go from three to six, you narrow the main beam. So if you have more elements, you narrow the beam. Have more side lobes. And if we add the phase shifters. So that's a f simple concept for us to start off with. Now this... Um, video shows you if we have two dipoles radiating as we move off into the distance th they move off and you can see there's a set of destructive and constructive interference that appears with the different wave fronts and that's just what's going to happen if phased arrays only this is a two-dimensional, just a two-dimensional version. And I talked about a little bit in the two view graphs back. Is say we have, because we're going to start going with some algebra, and it's going to get a little more comp complex as each view graph progresses mathematically. Say we have not two or three, but n elements spaced a distance d apart. And they all emit 
they're all coherent in phase. They start off at zero and they go out. This is a broadside beam. So you see out in the direction, perpendicular to the array, way out, in the far field, they're all going to add up and you'll get a, a bump. You'll get constructive interference in the broadside. And if we want to scan to 30 degrees, as I said, we'll adjust the phase with these phase shifters so that at an angle of 30 degrees, they'll all constructively interfere. And one would expect, if you go to angles like 35 or 40, there'd be a lot of destructive interference that would appear. And so that's why you get the side lobes. And this is a visualization of that effect. Now let's look, look, oh, look at mathematically, excuse me, what we're doing. For each of these elements, we have a set of variables. And uh, the first set are those associated with the array itself. And that is, it's the geometrical configuration of the array. Here we're going to be first talking about a linear array of elements, but they could be have rectangular spacing in two dimensions, triangular spacing in two dimensions, or, or other geometrical configurations. We're going to be talking about a number of elements, say, in a linear array, n elements. And it, it could be n elements in one direction and m in another direction if it was a rectangular array with equal spacing between all elements. And then there's going to be an element separation in each of the directions if it's a two-dimensional array or in that one dimension if it's a, a, a linear array. And now for each element, there's going to be an excitation, which is going to have an amplitude and a phase shift. And I assumed when I was talking earlier that the amplitude excitation was one always, but it, is, it doesn't have to be, and it isn't a lot of it most of the time. But for that simple case, now we're generalizing to it could be a, a set of different excitations. But here is the important thing about steering is the phase. So we've got the phase shifts that we can apply that will give the element the scanning. And then we have the individual elements pattern itself, whether the individual element is a monopole, just a omnidirectional antenna element, or a dipole. And so there's going to be element fat part of the antenna, which is in red, and the array factor, which is in blue. Okay, now let's move on to it, the generalized concept of an array factor. The array factor is a factor that it's the normalized radiation pattern of an array of isotropic point source elements. It's just a normalized pattern of isotropic point source elements that don't take to, into account at all the individual radiation pattern of the element. It does take into account the, the phase and the amplitude in the phase shifter and, we, and what it says is we add up the, at, at a point in space, R, unit vector, at theta and phi, we can calculate how the, what is the effect of sources at, at position 1, 2, 3, up to N. We can add them all up and find out and we'd be adding in, of course, the excitation vectors and the amplitudes and find out what is the effect of the interference between all the, and constructive or destructive, 
uh, how they add up at a, at a given point. And the observation vector is this. Obviously, we're in a, a spherical coordinate system. And the free space propagation constant is just 2 pi over lambda k. You'll see that all over the place. And the position vector of each of the elements is given this form. And the excitation element, where we, instead of having 1, 2, 3, 4, just the, we're using the, the uh, index sub n to indicate which of the, here, which of the, which of the elements we're talking about. Now, to calculate that array factor for n linear elements is just this algebra. And, and psi is the phase shift between the elements. And psi is a function of theta is k d cosine theta plus beta. And it's assumed that the phase progression is linear. That is, this phase is just n times some amount beta in phase. And a sub n is real. And, for an, and it says a sub n is constant. And using the, this cute little identity, this sum transforms down to a sine x over x form. The location of the main beam is when uh, psi is 0. And that's when psi over 2 is plus or minus m pi. If you think this is a little bit of uh, much to do, um, I, I still read, it's still like a, a nightmare. This was one of three problems that I had to do in a graduate school, in my E and M grad course in e, the in first year of grad school at UPenn, and um, it's literally to derive this. I got most of it right. <laughs> Anyway, in other words, just given what these numbers were for an arbitrary angle, what is this and derive the, the different um, locations of the minima and whatever. Now, the properties of an n element linear array are that it has major and it's make up major lobes and side lobes. The main lobe narrows as n increases. I pointed that out earlier. The number of side lobe increases as n, the number of elements. The width of the main lobe is 2 pi over n. And the height of the side lobes decreases as n increases. And a changing beta will steer the beam. The peak, excuse me, changing beta will steer the peak of the beam to the desired theta equal theta 0. And the beam direction varies from 0 to pi. And psi varies from minus kd plus beta to kd plus beta. And the, there's the condition for no grading lobes. And I'm going to get into a minute about what grading lobes and how they come here. Is that d over lambda is less than 1 over 1 plus the magnitude of cosine of theta 0, where theta 0 is the angle off broadside that you're moving the beam. And that's how theta 0 is defined. OK. Now, for a 10 element linear array scanned to 60 degrees, um, let's assume we've got an element factor, the square root of cosine theta. And then the array factor for a spacing of lambda over 2 scanned to 60 degrees comes out to this factor. Then the total pattern that you have is the multiplic the product of the element factor and the array factor. That's the relative field strength. And it, of course, if we're dealing with dB, it would be the sum of them. 
the factors. So you're going to have a, a factor due to the element pattern and the array pattern. And that is going to give you uh, across the array. So as we see here that there is uh, an array factor at this angle and a element factor and they both they come out to the to this amount right here. So the overall array gain is the product of these two and in DB they add and the array factor for a two-dimensional uh, array is 4 pi divided by the total power radiated the array factor magnitude squared and if you integrate over a solid angle you get the total power radiated okay now here's a, a problem for the students to do that are taking this course for credit calculate the normalized array factor for an element for an array of three isotropic radiating elements. Uh, they are located along the x-axis, the center one at the origin, space lambda over two apart, relative information is on view graph two and three, two or three back. And use the results of this calculation and the information in view graph, I believe it's 28, and antennas part one to calculate the radiation pattern of a linear array of three dipoles, lambda over two apart in the x-axis. Okay, now let's look visually, and this is where the real, the physical understanding is. Let's look at the effect on the array size by adding elements. Okay, so the, we've got a linear broadside array. These red dots are the, is the array. They're isotropic elements. The spacing is lambda over two apart. There's no phase shifting, so we're just going to have a broadside beam perpendicular to the array. Here we see it's the angle off broadside is zero. And with 10 elements, we get this gain with this many side lobe, with this many nulls and side lobes. And with double the number of elements, you see we get about double the number of side lobe and you can see it gets thinner and we go to 40 and it gets even thinner and in general for long broadside arrays the gain is approximately twice the number of elements times times d divided by lambda 